Thank you for joining the inaugural From Paws to Claws Visionary 2020 series. Your Office of Alumni Relations is appreciative of your support during the month of June, and we promise as we move to twice a month, the rest of the series, that we will bring you stellar alumni to present relevant topics that will support the recent graduates, as well as alumni who join seeking job changes in their careers, and those who just want to lean their support. As always, we wish to thank the alumni panelists who have shared in the past and the ones who will come forth today in their area of expertise. We did not seek you out, yet you came running with the spirit of a panther, which we are, <coughs> your knowledge base when you called to say that you wanted to participate. But before we start, let me share a tad bit of history of the Office of Alumni Relations signature event from Paws to Claws. The Alumni Student Networking event was originally designed in 2008 when Kareem Taylor, class of 2010, in his sophomore year, expressed that students should learn from alumni. Over the years, we have continuously called on the alumni community to embrace our alumni in waiting, commonly known as students. We encircle them with their becoming a member of the only permanent constituency of our alma mater. As Cubs, they bounce and pounce through the discovery academically, socially, and spiritually, finding their way as their talents grow into claws and become fully entrenched felines of service locally, nationally, and globally, while remembering to provide financial support to the institution that developed and placed them on their path of well-rounded citizens. There is more to the program and feel free to read the entire historical review in the alumni section on the CAU website. This newest edition is dedicated to the Perfect Vision class of 2020. As of the alumni community, we did not have the opportunity to fully engage the class this past spring. So we can begin our conversation. I would like to express many thanks to my colleague Chastity B. Evans, class of 2010, who serves as the program manager in the Office of Alumni Relations. She will be your host for the series was created by her and for our interaction. Chastity, it is now your time to begin the conversation. Well, thank you so much, alumna Galen E. Gatewood Joshua for that wonderful introduction and historical context. Welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining your Office of Alumni Relations for the Vision 2020 series, Professionals, Value of Mapping Your Future, What's Next? Special thank you to alumna Dr. Michelle Rhodes, Program Specialist for the Office of Online Learning and Continuing Education for being the technical commander behind all of our webinars. Thank you so much. Now let's go into the purpose for today. COVID-19 may have canceled your summer plans, but it doesn't have to delay your future success. Have it become the Instagram or Twitter superstar you were hoping to be when quarantine began? Well, the next best thing quarantine provides is an excellent opportunity to reflect on your goals and the best ways to achieve them, understanding how to expand your network, increasing your industry and functional knowledge, and continuing to position your goals for future success. Alumni leaders, let's discuss when is the right time to elevate the next steps and what we can do now to be prepared for our future. Just a little housekeeping rules before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel. I will bring them up during our Q&A section to discuss. Before we get started, um, this week has been 
rather challenging for the Office of Alumni Relations and the alumni community in whole. Let's all give a moment of silence for our alums who have lost their lives due to COVID-19 and to other reasons, um, you know, related. So um, please um, definitely keep in your prayers and thoughts the families of um, alumnus Selden, alumna O'Neill, alumnus Cohen, and alumnus Maybach. So, and all of the other alums that have lost their lives uh, during this year. So let's please give them a moment of silence. Now, without further ado, introducing our first panelist for today is Dr. Roger Carruth. Alumnus Dr. Carruth attended Clark Atlanta University, where he received a BA in Mass Communications and an MPA in International Administration and Development, a Juris Doctor degree with an emphasis on entertainment, business, and technology law from John Marshall Law School in 1999, and a PhD from Howard University in 2013. Alumnus Dr. Carruth currently teaches at Howard University and the Strategic Legal and Management Communication, known as SLMC Department, of the Kathy Hughes School of Communications. He has taught at Morgan State University in the Strategic Communications Department, Baruch College, Zicklin School of Business and Queens College, and Political Science Department, both a part of the City University of New York System and Georgia Perimeter College, in the Department of History and Political Science. He recently concluded a three-year research fellowship in Enberg School of for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. Alumnus Carruth utilized interdisciplinary approaches to conduct qualitative and quantitative communications research through narrative inquiry, inquiry excuse me, historical analysis, traditional, social, digital, and emerging media. Alumnus Dr. Karuk's specialty focus includes international communications and the use of information communications technology, known as ICT, tools, specifically social media, to improve the quality and standard of life of Caribbean communities in the region and abroad. Specific areas of research include policy, law, education, politics, health, economics, culture, agribusiness, tourism, and hospitality, and the energy development. As a volunteer and active community member in Washington, D.C., he serves on the board of H Street Main Street, a nonprofit that has played a key part of the revitalization um, efforts of the H Street Corridor in the District of Columbia, and served as a member of the local alcohol and beverage licensing community for ANC6A located in Ward 6. Other boards and commissions include the Caribbean Tourism Organization Foundation, the Mayor's Advisory Commission on Caribbean Community Affairs, um, Caribbean Communications and Upliftment Jamaica. Thank you so much Dr. Karuth for coming out today and for serving your alma mater with an impressive bio, and we are so happy to have you today. Thanks for having me. Um, no problem. So your first question for today, alumnus Karuk. Um, what did you put off that you wish you had spent more time on? And as a follow-up, this question can be job-related or professional, uh, whichever way you decide to take it today. Um, First of all, I want to say thank you again for having me to be on this panel with this distinguished uh, Panther alums. And I'm looking forward to the, the conversations today. Um, I thought about the question and um, I want to have to honestly say I haven't gotten to that point yet. I think CAU prepared me and I'm sure my colleagues so well that um, as opportunities or uh, difficulties come up, we, we learn how to navigate through them. And I think one of the best, if not the most important skill that um, I developed at, at, at CAU was the ability to think critically and problem solve. So as we move into different aspects of our life, 
personal or professional, I don't think that there, there's something that I, I think uh, that I missed an opportunity to, to take advantage of. Okay. Well, if talent is the joyful expression of your unique abilities, you know, since you've yet to find that yet, how are you using your talents to benefit you? And, you know, as well as the CAU community or the world overall, because I, you know, I see that you are a renowned traveler, you know, you are going back and forth and you're very interested in the Caribbean communications as well as Howard, CAU, you know, and some other areas that you have up your pocket. So, you know, tell us a little bit about that. Um, I would say um, being at a HBCU, CAU in particular, um, it, it teaches you how to network. And I think we do that so well. Mm -hmm. I think we stay connected, um, uh, particularly nowadays with social media, we, we are aware of what our colleagues, our peers are doing. And we have learned how to be um, given open people. So we, we connect each other to each other. And I think that grows the, the opportunity for us to continue to, to benefit from our skills and the, the things that we've learned. So I would say at the end of the day, uh, connecting people is probably the thing that brings me the joy the most. Um, independently, Brandon and Marshall and I um, are in, operating in different spaces, but because of the CAU connection and then continue networking, we, we meet at different spaces. And I think that's the uniqueness of um, being a part of the CAU family. And then um, coming back, for example, to homecoming, the, to reconnect and, get to see people in person and see what what's going on you know Vanessa and, and I were joking around about some of our Caribbean roots prior to the conversation growing up in New York so there's so many connections he's in the communications field as am I um, to a certain degree so I think those are the things that that, that are most prominent at, to me at this time and networking and connecting and making sure we can point people to other places that and other folks that can help them as people matriculate through various aspects of, of their journey. Got it. So definitely networking and connecting. I like that. Um, it seems that you have um, done a quite of a deal of uh, networking, connecting with your son, you know, as we uh, have a little surprise for you all that's on the webinar for today. Um, Dr. Carruth, you want to tell us a little bit about this video before we play it and how it's uh, being connected to our last panelist for today? Okay, well, sure. Um, my son is an up-and-coming NASCAR driver in the Drive for Diversity program, and obviously with the spotlight that's on Bubba Wallace now being one of the being the only current Black driver, um, the opportunity for him to, for my son in particular, to fulfill his dream, um, I just helped him along the way and we're at a, a tipping point where, again, the CAU family has been supportive in so many ways, on and off, visibly and behind the scenes. And as I got here, um, so another colleague introduced me to Brandon, who's uh, familiar with the program and we connected and that connection just continued to grow. So while there, you know, because I'm a lifelong learner, as you can tell from my bio, um, I put my production hat back on. So while I'm here, in this new space that I'm not familiar with, I said, what can I do to make the best use of my time? So I just started shooting um, content, um, which I've always done, but it just became more relevant as the summer went along and he progressed and continued to get better. Why can I, what can I do with it? And ultimately we created a short documentary and what you're getting ready to see is just kind of a one minute trailer um, highlighting the program and just kind of what he's doing in his own space. Uh, trying to become a NASCAR professional driver um, at this point at 18. Awesome. When we heard about Roger and then read his resume, he is progressing well, looks like to be a very good future talent. see him especially compared to the other kids he's more focused he's racing at some of the best guys you know battling for top tens and only your sixth or seventh or eighth that's awesome i think if he keeps on this path he could be a top driver someday
First heat race through the night. We're glad you joined us for round number 10 here. John with summer shoot up games just opened about three minutes ago. And glad to have you filing your way into the grandstand area. In five years, hopefully, be in, in a truck somewhere or maybe Xfinity car. Full field of cars, here we go. I don't want to be first black driver to win a race or first black driver to make the playoffs or any of that. I want to be the best. My ultimate goal is to be a cup champion. Wow, that is amazing. Wow, kudos to you for being an awesome father and for definitely supporting your son through this um, wonderful adventure. We definitely look forward to supporting him as well and um, having his back 100%. So. Mm. If you can, though, um, in the chat or, um, you know, definitely drop his handles as well so we can, uh, you know, look forward and follow his story of Through the Fences. So. And, and then thank you. And this is a quick plug. Brandon, you know, congratulations to him. He'll talk about it, but he's just been elevated to this super visible role that's hand on everything that you see in the media with Bubba and Black Drivers and Diversity. And, you know, we're happy to be a part of the CAE family and the right. NASCAR family under his tutelage. Well, we're definitely rooting for number 13, Dr. Crew. Thank you so much for that. Definitely is a testimony of networking and connecting everyone. That's it right there in full, if you're, if you're listening. <laughs> if you all have any questions for alumnus Dr. Carew, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel now. We'll be sure to get to them during our Q&A session. All right. Introducing our next panelist for this afternoon is alumna Vanessa Caesar. A native New Yorker from Jamaica, Queens, alumna Caesar was raised in a house filled with music. At the age of 10, Caesar's career goal was to be a manager of a radio station. Wow. This passion for radio sent her to Clark Atlanta University, where she was one of the founding members of the student radio station known as WSCU. After receiving a BA in mass communications, she began her journey through the entertainment industry at Radio One Atlanta. From that moment, entertainment was her life. The Atlanta music scene in the late 90s and the early 2000s set the foundation for an extensive career in the industry she loved. In 2002, Vanessa returned to New York and upon the, su the suggestion of a friend, decided to tap into the world of film and TV production. Wearing many hats over her 23-year-old career, she has held positions on various productions, such as 30 Rock on NBC, Royal Pains on USA, Inside Man on Universal, and Harry on Fox, just to name a few. Beginning as an eager intern to most recently manager of production finance at Complex Media, there were many challenges along the journey. With a very direct approach to managing, she continues to be committed and passionate to getting the job done. Alumna Caesar is active in her community as the financial secretary of the National Association of University Women, Flushing North Shore Branch president of the Greater New York Chapter for CAU's Alumni Association. And most importantly, she is an amazing mom to her 10-year-old amazing drama son and future Jeff, Michael. Thank you so much, Alumna Caesar, for being on the, on the webinar today. We truly appreciate you, and we look forward to hearing more about your production wonders. Thank you, alumna Chastity. Um, it is amazing to be here with my peers and my friends and my family, um, as well as the alumni community. Uh, thank you for your support. No problem, no problem. Thank you. Now tell us, when were you able to use your talents, your skills and gifts? And what were you doing and how did you feel? Uh, that question brings me to the first time that I was able to use my talents and gifts. Um, it actually was in church. 
uh, I was tasked uh, along with my best friend to uh, produce a concert for um, our youth and the concert sold out. That experience, that feeling um, was just a blessing to know that we impacted the lives of 2000 people. It was from at that point that I learned um, how to impact people with entertainment, whether it is, you know, making people happy by producing a concert, which was that, or a show, a TV show, or being a part of a TV show. Um, many people come to me and they're like, oh, you worked on that show? That was amazing. You know, um, I love that show. Or, um, you know, that show is my, my favorite. I watch it over and over again. That just um, brings me joy as well, just to know that I was a part of that. Um, and as far as my talents are concerned, I, you know, I call myself the people person. I love to have fun in whatever I do. It doesn't matter, um, you know, what it is, where I am. I make sure that, you know, whoever is around me, that we enjoy what we are doing. And um, I bring that to work. Um, in production, production is very tough. Um, it's long hours. It's not easy to get into. So you really have to, um, you really have to be able to, you know, enjoy it. You're there for 12, 14 hours sometimes. You have to have some type of fun. And please believe that I bring the fun as well as professionalism um, in whatever I do. Uh, Marshall understands, you understand as well, alumna chastity, um, what I bring to the table. Um, I do appreciate Marshall for allowing me to bring my talents and efforts to the alumni community um, as I began to serve as president under his presidency as alumni president. So. Um, wherever I am, I truly, you know, bring the fun, bring the seriousness, and we get the job done. Exactly, and I can wholeheartedly agree to that. And being in production, being a people person is a plus, because you rarely find anyone in finance a people person. <laughs> they are that is very diverse. true. <laughs> That's really true. And with, with me being in finance, um, it's, really, it's really tough, because I serve a... Um, I say that like I'm I'm weird. I'm a weird person in fi as far as far as finance is concerned because most of, most of them are like to the book. This is it, you know. And I come and I bring, you know. I'm smiling, you know. My team is smiling, so I, I pride myself in that wherever I go. Um, and even at Complex in this COVID quarantine work experience, you know, when we're on our Zoom calls, I'm like, hey, good morning, you know. <laughs> you have to bring that personality. Um, into every situation and to me that's one of my talents and sometimes that's good to have because you never know what the other person may be experiencing so you probably blessed them with a smile today we will see a coke for a little bit of coke and a smile but a coffee and a smile let's just say that <laughs> so what is your why vanessa i mean and this question is important because it helps us to identify why we are going after our dreams you know if one of our goals is to lose some weight why exactly do we want to lose this weight? You know, if our dream is to become CEO in our organization, like why do we want it? What will becoming CEO do for us? Like, do we want it because of the associated status or because of the CEO salary that would allow us to give our family a better life? You know, the why is a deep seated reason behind our goals. And I really feel like, you know, with you, being a mother, you know, being a supporter, being a very hardcore go-getter for your alma mater, and being highly embedded into the production world, you know, you can definitely attest to what is your why. Absolutely. Well, my why is twofold. Um, my why, my personal why, if you will, is of course for my family um, and for myself, for us to achieve, you know, success. And success does not always equal dollars, you know, to achieve success in life, enjoying life, um, you know, living the best life, as they say, you know, living your best life. Um, that's, that's my why for my family. Um, professionally, my why is the impact, the legacy. Um, and, and the two can be combined in some sense. Um, in everything I do, my name is on it. So my why is my legacy. My why is the impact, the impact, the lives. When I teach dance, to my students, I want to impact their lives in a positive way so that 20 years later, they're like, oh my goodness, I remember what Ms. Vanessa said. You know, my why with working with Clark Atlanta um, and just impacting students, new students, alumni is, you know, 
I remember when we did X, Y, and Z and Ms. Vanessa or Vanessa said, and, and it's just to trigger th a thought process in someone. Um, you know, the history that we learned at Clark Atlanta is, is very um, vast. And so, you know, to continue that legacy, to continue that, a lot of people ask me, why do you do so much for Clark Atlanta? Because I love my school. You know, I love what I do as far as production is concerned, um, creating amazing content uh, for people to see. Um, one of my greatest projects that I was a part of for a year is called Random Acts of Flyness. And that was a it has a large cult following. They could have paid me maybe a hundred dollars. I'm not even going to lie to you guys, but just to be a part of that was such an amazing project that people continually still talk about. And so it is to impact the lives of others in every way possible, whether it's my family, whether it is, you know, someone I meet in, in different organizations, um, but to impact the lives of others with my spirit, with my light. And um, I thank God for allowing me to be able to do that. And I will continue to do that until he takes me out of here. Um, that is my purpose. That is why I was brought here. And that is amazing. I feel like we need an acronym for impact. <laughs> 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 you know, to go underneath the Alumni Association or Alumni Relations, you know, for the New York chapter. Because, yeah. Got you. It's, it's coming up. I got you. <laughs> We're ready. Check. You know, please credit me on the side. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, alumna Caesar. You always bring us light and, um, you know, positive vibes, no doubt. I am digging this panel because you guys are rocking it. So if you all have any questions for alumna Caesar, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel now. We will be sure to get to them during our Q&A session. All right, now we're moving along, we're moving along. So now we're introducing our third panelist for this afternoon. It's alumnus Marshall J. Taggart, Jr. Alumnus Marshall J. Taggart, Jr. joined the Montgomery Regional Airport as his executive airport director on May 15, 2019, after previously serving as deputy airport management professional at the Premier Executive General Aviation Airport located in Metro North Atlanta. His leadership endeavors does not stop there. He is currently the National Director of Airport Business Development for Advantage Networks, now MediaShift Incorporated, located in Glendale, California, and recently functioned as the Deputy Aviation Director for Tallahassee Regional, now International Airport in 2013. Alumnus Taggart has co-managed a $10.5 million operating budget, 43 full-time employees, secured nonstop air service from Tallahassee to Washington, D.C., and from Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, to West Palm Beach, Florida. He has launched a new career civil airways, formerly known as Gulfstream, thanks again, passenger loyalty program, executed successful marketing and communications plans to partner with local North Florida chambers to market the airport as the gateway to the Gulf Coast, and established the first annual Airport Fun Fest and Barbecue Challenge in 2011, an Airport Fun Fest, and several more in 2012. Alumnus Taggart will receive his doctoral degree in political science from CAU in the spring of 2021. As a double CAU alum, Marshall graduated magna cum laude receiving an MPA with dual concentrations in public finance and urban management in the summer of 1997, as well as cum laude with a BA in accounting in spring of 1992. Alumnus Taggart is a 2008 graduate of the National Forum for, public, for Black Public Administrators, Executive Leadership Program for Aspiring Senior Public Executives, recipient of NFBPA's 2007 Stephen E. Ford Young Public Administrator of Year Award and served as the youngest national president of the Conference of Minority Public Administrators in 2002. From 2014 to 2018, Alumnus Taggart served as National Alumni Association President for the CAU Alumni Association. 
Under his leadership, the CAUAA Incorporated Board raised $450,000 in student scholarships and increased the number of chapters from 14 to 40. Alumnus Taggart received the National 2016 44th President Barack Obama Lifetime Award for Community Service, the National Alumni President of the Year Award from the National Black College Hall of Fame, and was awarded the 2015 Southern Regional Alumni Brother of the Year Award. Taggart also holds civic memberships in the following organizations, Sigma Pi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, Alpha Zeta Boulay, Vice President of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, Omicron Phi Lambda Chapter, Prince Hall Affiliated Third Degree Master Mason, W.C. Thomas Lodge, number one, um, 112, and a member of the 100 Black Men of South Metro Atlanta Chapter. He has been married for 21 years to the former Sherry L. Foster, a 1992 CAU alumnae, native Chicagoan, they are proud parents of two adult children, William Joseph and Lauren Christian. In his spare time, alumnus Taggart loves to travel with his family, follow historically black college and university marching bands, play golf, and collect African-American history books, articles, and artifacts. His greatest achievement is his family and the love they share. How awesome. Welcome so much, alumnus Taggart. How are you doing today? Alumna Chastity, you did a great job. Thanks again, and uh, it is a it's a pleasure to be here. I'm not I'm I'm watching the time, and I want to be respectful for everybody because we have a <laughs> brother who I definitely want to hear from, who's following me, uh, Brandon, uh, and then of course you hear Roger, then Vanessa. You know, it's it's just a pleasure, and uh, I applaud Alumna Galen Gatewood Joshua in terms of yourself, your staff, uh, Michelle Dukes Rhodes uh, from back <laughs> in the day, right? Because uh, I have a long storied history of uh, graduating and coming into the first entering class of uh, Clark Atlanta University in 1988. And so that's always a pleasure to me to see the history and how it has evolved. And growing up in Atlanta of its two historical institutions, Clark College and Atlanta University. So it's, it's a pleasure for me and an honor. And I'm very humbled to be here today. So, uh, Chaz, go ahead. You, you got the floor. Questions? All right. All right. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much. So what? So what are you doing right? What are you doing right now that is allowing you to have this positive, transformative effect on others? I mean, because you're glowing right now, Marshall. I mean, you're doing it. So in the workplace and from a personal perspective, like what are you doing right now? God is good. That's the first thing. I mean, I, I give honor to to that higher power that really has really coveted uh, myself, my life. Uh, it hadn't always been. Uh, a great experience in life. You know, there are trials and tribulations, there are valleys and there are peaks and mountains that you will achieve. But I think in the long run, as long as you believe and know that someone has your back and that you are an instrument to help others, that's the key. How do you pay it forward? And I'll, I'll start that off because that's what Clark Atlanta University has taught me. And when you're talking about a career and you really want to progress in a career, Choose a career in which you're going to give back to others. You can't go wrong. You will always be successful. If you are always giving your time, your talent, and your treasure to these individuals and really working 100%, you'll receive those blessings. They'll come right back to you. Uh, Chastity, you know that I'm executive airport director at a, an airport in Montgomery, Alabama. And let's talk about Montgomery. Montgomery, of course, uh, cradle of the Confederacy but also the birthplace of civil rights. So you have two different dichotomies associated with time in essence. I actually live on Dexter Avenue where Dexter Avenue Baptist Church is where King actually was a pastor. But right down the street on the, on the side of uh, the north side of the street, Jefferson Davis also hit the telegram to start the Civil War uh, right there on Dexter. So there's a very unique history when you talk about at the end of the street is the state capitol. At the base of the street is where slaves were actually marched from the Alabama River to in turn be sold to different communities throughout the Alabama location. So that leads into the historical part of me being the first African-American uh, executive airport director. I didn't ask for that. 
And I didn't even know it was a, a, the case until I found out. And I started looking on the kind of the honor wall. And then I saw all these white male faces of all the airport directors. <laughs> I said, I guess I'll be on the other end. My chocolate face will be. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess when you look at the employees and people that are there, it's always a uh, rarity to see uh, the first African-American. So the first thing people are uh, thinking is that, hey, what is he going to do to change it? Well, I, in turn, come from a background of working at two large hubs, two, one medium hub, one small hub, a non-hub, and a general aviation airport. This is my sixth airport that I've worked in. Nice. So coming from Hartsfield, Jackson, Chicago Hare, Chicago Midway, Tallahassee Regional, the Cap Peachtree Airport, and now Montgomery, they have a talent professional. I've been in the business for 20 plus years. Uh, and in between that, I decided to kind of balance it all and meet my goals. Hey, one, I wanted to receive my PhD. And I did that uh, while in turn working on my coursework. And thank you, Roger, for being my inspiration because he's my classmate in the MPA program. And I said, hey, I was deciding between that and law and I said PhD would be an excellent opportunity for why I am serving as the National Alumni Association President. So finished my coursework, finished my uh, actual uh, uh, comps and now working on my dissertation. But awesome. just to let you know, you can do it. And if you really look at our two models with, from, what I, from my, what I live from, from this example, definitely making sure the first piece is, you know, culture for service, paying it forward. I would want us to, for all alums who are here listening and tuning in on this call, always pay it forward. My first two interns are, were Clark Atlanta University students, okay? my in terms of me in terms of moving them forward then i had two additional from alabama state so i'm an hbcu uh, person I always support hbcus and then now i have one individual now who's starting as from alabama state who also is a, another intern female so i've had a and then another gentleman who's at a, a pwi who's studying to become a pilot now all mm -hmm. of these individuals are african-americans and you know, my board asked the question, why are you only hiring black people? I said, I'm not hiring black people, I'm hiring qualified individuals and we are underrepresented in the industry. There are only roughly about 12 to 13 African-American executive airport directors who run airports. I said, we have a responsibility to make sure that we put people in the industry. So that's key. So when you talk about culture for service and you ask the question, what am I doing? I'm, I'm in turn trying to level the playing field but at the same time, running an airport, going through COVID-19 uh, and making sure that we stay afloat. We've had no layoffs. We've had no furloughs. Uh, we've been able to manage efficiently. All of our flights are coming back at our airport. So we're very happy about that. We're practicing social distancing, plexiglass, things on the ground, on the floor. And I'm proud to say after my first year uh, there, I, I did receive a 3.5 out of 4.0 in terms of my evaluation. Nice. Uh, board uh, did give me a raise and also too, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not in any form of fashion bragging. I'm just telling you God's gifts working through me to influence others and really impacting the Montgomery community because as a whole, African-Americans tended not to use the, the utility in the city. And so now we have a footprint of having a, an individual who looks like them to sell them and say fly M MGM. We want cheats in seats. And I say that all the time. <laughs> if people fly the airport, okay? Let's make sure we move forward. You know, I'm going to mix it up the Clark Atlanta University way. Well, I hope <laughs> this is your first question. <laughs> cheats in seats. I love it. <laughs> look, no, um, I'm not. Look, not these I'm cheats, right? <laughs> I might have to look. I, I, I may I have to quote you later on. I might have to quote you. <laughs> So what do you say are some short-term losses, um, you know, you're willing to accept to reap the future gains? Like, why is this important, especially well, people working at MGM? I have a beautiful spouse, okay? I say that because we are Clark Atlanta University alums. We're both graduates of class of 92. She was my accounting tutor. We both majored wow. in accounting. Uh, so I think when you think about having that, that basis of CAU, I mean, it in turn helped me to find a spouse to get a good quality education, have my kids, one of my, my son to be educated there. Uh, and it's an opportunity in my mind to say, how do you build and move forward in your career by maintaining work-life family? Well, my spouse said to me when this position came up, because I didn't go searching for it, someone called me about it. 
and I asked her, you know, we've already done the long distance thing with Tallahassee. And uh, I came back to Atlanta. And I said, how do you feel about me taking this opportunity to actually run an airport? Uh, I was number two in Tallahassee. And her comment to me was, go for it. This is your dream. So to have a very supportive spouse, uh, that's very important. And I would say, if you haven't found a spouse, all the alums who are on the call and on the thread, all you got to do is look. Clark Atlanta University makes the best background, makes the best couples. I, I'm, I'm plugging my alma mater that way, too. But I think the loss is associated with the comfort zone of being in Atlanta. You have to make those sacrifices in your career. You have to deal with the racism. You have to deal with the classism. You have to be willing to balance all these things in order to become successful. Because every day is not going to be a, a nice day. Um, it's not going to be rosy. And so I think in this, in this regard, you have to be able to understand and have a true faith. So that's one of the losses. I'm not in Atlanta. I live in Montgomery. I still own my home here. Um, and from a family standpoint, we go back and forth. And sometimes I'm away from my family. So that's one of the losses that you're going to have, the, the actually having the family there. So be, be ready to, to deal with that uh, if you want to succeed. The other piece of that is just understanding about your comfort zone. Uh, there are going to be scenarios where you're going to have to one day stand next to a Jeff Sessions. I'm going to let y'all just hear that. Stand next to a Jeff Sessions, okay? You may have to meet Trump. And your personal beliefs may not be the dichotomy of the political component of what you're dealing with in, in, in the particular locale you're in. So you have to learn to be able to balance your personal convictions with what you're doing on your job. So I'll stop there. I think uh, it's an opportunity, again, to address everyone. And any questions that you may have, I'm more than willing to answer those questions as we move forward. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. I mean, there's a lot that we could take with that and we can run with it. So everyone, if you definitely have questions for alumnus Taggart, now it's the time to drop those into the Q&A session so we can, um, you know, get those questions answered for you. Because that was a lot of, lot of great gems that he just dropped. So thank you. Last but never least, introducing our final panelist for this afternoon is alumnus Brandon M. Thompson. Vice President for NASCAR's Diversity and Inclusion. Alumnus Thompson is a 2005 graduate of Clark Atlanta University, where he majored in business administration and concentrated in marketing. Thompson has spent three years as an account executive in what is now known as NASCAR's Industry Operations Department before serving as Senior Account Executive in NASCAR's Diversity Affairs Department. While present, Thompson implemented the Wendell Scott Commemorative Decal Program, which honors the first Black driver to win a NASCAR Cup Series race and become inducted NASCAR Hall of Fame. Alumnus Thompson also executed the launch of NASCARDiversity.com. After a two-year stint as the operations manager at Revolution Racing, where he created the Revolution Racing Driving School and managed their youth racing program, Thompson returned to NASCAR as manager of racing operations. In this role, Rookie of the Year programs for the NASCAR Cup Series, Xfinity and Gander RV and Outdoors Truck Series, weekly and yearly purse distri distribution, sponsor approvals, and managing the day-to-day -day functions of the Drive for Diversity program fell under his attention and care. In July 2016, alumnus Thompson was tapped to lead the competition in operations of NASCAR's regional and touring series, i.e. NASCAR's minor leagues. That role has since evolved to include the sales and marketing efforts. Most recently, the 17-year-old industry veteran was the first diversity intern graduate to join NASCAR's executive rank as an officer in his current role as Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion. In his spare time, the Nashville, Tennessee native enjoys music, spending time with his family, and coaching youth sports. 
Alumnus Thompson resides in Charlotte, North Carolina with his wife, Marquetta, and his son, Kari. Welcome, Alumnus Thompson. How are you doing today? And super huge congratulations to your new role. We are so proud of you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And uh, as Roger mentioned, just uh, happy to be here and, and humbled to be here on this, on this esteemed panel. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and jump into this question, shall we? What do Let's you do believe? <laughs> cool. Awesome. What do you believe created your present circumstances? And you know, are your assumptions limiting how you view your life? And you know, what do you see as your end game? Either one of those you want to target. Go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, you know when I think about what I believe created my present circumstances, it's sort of a three part three part answer. I, you know, a lot, I think each one of the panelists have. I've touched on the fact that you know I certainly certainly give honor to God for 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 blessing me throughout my career uh, and and life. Um, and so you know as I, as I get older, it's less important which pronouns people put on God or what they choose to to name it. But um, certainly certainly believe that as as I believe Marshall referenced, God is certainly good. I think the second thing, which kind of leads, <laughs> uh, kind of coincides with that, is I think every um, every stop on the journey throughout my career has literally prepared me for this moment. So whether it was, you know, being in, starting as an intern uh, through the diversity internship program, uh, working on, sort of on the on the on the quasi competition side as my first first job in NASCAR, coming back uh, and managing the internship program in which I was a participant, and then moving on to uh, Revolution Racing, which which uh, houses the D4D program, which is the same program that Roger Caruth, Roger's son, is participating in now. And then even on the you know the the, the last two stints in terms of uh, managing uh, the competition aspect of the minor leagues and, and the racing operations role, like I said, have, have all literally um, prepared me for this moment. And then uh, the final piece of that for me is you know it, a, a very simple answer: it's CAU. So I it, I would not be uh, at NASCAR more than likely if it wasn't for uh, some of the counselors and things that we that we had who were pushing internships and who curated internship opportunities. I literally found the opportunity. Uh, to be uh, to participate in the NASCAR diversity internship program, being nosy on on a counselor's desk, who, who frankly allowed us to do that, and, and was very uh, open in, in a very closed, uh, very small office, and so she was she was more than <laughs> more than kind with to share her space. But uh, so yeah, th that's 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 kind of how how I look at that. Uh, I guess in terms of um, what do I see as the end game, you know, as I was reading the title. You know, this particular panel and this, uh, I probably approach it differently than a lot of a lot of people may. Uh, in that, I've not really set a goal based on a title or a, or a particular job throughout my career. Um, one of my favorite books is uh, by Bill Walsh. It's the autobiography of Bill Walsh, and it's called "The Score Take Care of Itself." And I've sort of uh, patterned my career after that, in in, in the sense that uh, I've kind of just kept my nose down and, and worked hard. Uh, harkening back to those. Uh, to those work ethics that were instilled in us at CAU and uh, sort of let everything, let the chips fall where they may and just sort of take it, take it as it comes. Nice. Um, if you can, um, please drop that book into our, to our chat, you know, so people can definitely follow that and, um, you know, purchase if necessary. So what are, um, what are your risk thresholds and, you know, how can you avoid playing things, you know, conservatively? Because I know NASCAR is, as you know, Marshall stated, you know, you, will have to meet, you know, Trump, or you will have to meet those people that, you know, don't necessarily agree, you know, with your political stances. So how do you play those things? Yeah, well, I think um, sort of two parts. I think as far as, and Marshall's right, you, I think that's in, regardless of what industry you're in, you're going to come across people who don't think like you, who don't look like you, who don't act like you, who don't share your same value sets, who's, you know, whose family circumstances are different, whatever the case is, there's just a difference of people in the world, right? And so that's just a, a, a fact of, of, of life. But I think uh, it's all it's all in a professionalism. As Vanessa uh, alluded to earlier, um, it, it's about uh, making sure that, you know, there's a time to speak, there's a time to speak up, but there's also a time to be quiet and listen and learn and everything doesn't have to be done in a militant fashion. I think, um, you know, there, there's some there's some finesse that needs to be involved throughout these things, and uh, I've certainly certainly experienced that. Have had you know, frankly, a couple uh, missteps where I've been a little too militant, and uh, on the other side, some some um, 
<laughs> some circumstances where I probably should have been a little bit more militant, but I think you learn from all of those, the goal is to learn from all those experiences and figure out and just try to judge a little bit better about when you need to be uh, more, more, more vocal. And sometimes when you need to uh, sort of do a little bit more of, a, of observing. So um, in regards to the, the risk, uh, it, it, that's an interesting question for me because I'm someone who tends to be, again, and when you put me uh, on, on a scale, I'm probably a little bit less, uh, less, um, risky, I guess you could say, a little bit more risk averse. Um, but I think that, um, you know, as you, you have to, as in most things in life, you right, you have to figure out, okay, if you're, if I'm going to be a little bit more risk averse in a certain area or just risk averse in general, you have to try to figure out some ways to, to work around that, uh, that personality trait of, of yours. And so you just kind of try to augment that, be, uh, be aware of it, number one, um, but then also not be afraid to, uh, to, assert yourself in certain situations that may appear risky because I think uh, at the end of the day, uh, most folks who, who tend to be a little bit more uh, risk averse, it's, it's, it's more due to fear. And I think the more you put yourself out there and the more you sort of take those risks, you become more comfortable and you can um, go out on the edge of the diving board just a little bit further before plunging in, so to speak. So uh, certainly a tip of the cap to all of those who, you know, entrepreneurs and things like that, I certainly admire that, that spirit. And, and I think as you as you go throughout your career or life or whatever the case may be, um, just, you know, being a little bit uh, not afraid to, to, again, go towards the edge of the diving board is important. And I wholeheartedly agree with that. And I feel like each and every last one of you all that is on this panel, even the people that help put this panel together and um, our um, attendees that are watching this webinar to, today, you know, are all risk takers. You know, we're all go-getters. If not, we wouldn't be on this uh, noon to one call today, um, you know, listening to other risk takers. So I feel like it is all about going to the end of that diving board and taking that plunge because at this day and age now, we have to do that, but we have to be smart and strategic about doing it. So thank you so much for that. And, um, you know, definitely going forward, I hope our students that are on this call, you know, can understand that sometimes you have to do that, you know, in order to be appreciated and move forward. So um, some things that uh, we could definitely take, uh, take a hand of and uh, really appreciate is definitely networking and connecting. You know, like Dr. Carew stated, it's all about knowing who it is and what it is. It's not necessarily sometimes about what you know. Sometimes it's about who you know. So network and connect and move forward, you know, be that people person, keep, but keep it professional, you know, like the net, like alumnus Caesar stated, as well as keeping that impact, forming that impact, utilizing the impact, you know, and paying the forward, like alumnus Tagger stated, nothing is better than giving back, you know, to wherever you came from and making a plunge, making that big splash, taking that risk, you know, where you are now. So you can allow others to follow suit and inspire others. So what a very inspiring panel today. I can definitely attest to that. Thank you so much, Alumnus Thompson, for breaking it down and for bringing your awareness and for allowing us to um, you know, know that it's okay to take that risk. If you have any questions for Alumnus Thompson, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel now. We will be sure to get to them during our Q&A session, which is now. So if you have your questions, let's go ahead and get those answered. So thank you again to our alumni panelists for the insightful gems that have released today to go forth with you. We will now go ahead and take some time for our questions. Just a reminder, if you are still typing or if you, you know, have an idea that you think that you may want to ask, go ahead and ask it. You know, just be sure to type it into the question box in your patrol panel. Now's the time to engage, you know. Let's engage and let's network and let's connect. So. It looks like we have a few um, questions, so let's go to them right now. So our first question is coming from alumna Hillman to alumna Caesar. She says, how do you graciously continue to thrive in your industry as an African-American female, professional and mom? How do you balance it all? 
Well, alumna Fenda, <laughs> uh, I must have, I must say that is definitely by the grace of God first, um, because you know being on set at times or being in the office um, on films and projects, uh, it's it's very time consuming, um, and so of course God is definitely He makes a way for me, um, and then I would have to say my family, um, my support system my family, my mother, uh, who I live around the corner from, which is amazing. Um, she's actually supporting me today. Um, she helps me a lot. Um, my, you know, my son's father, he's very much involved in his life and he really supports, um, you know, he supports his son. And so as a mom, that is important, um, you know, to have a super support system. My friends who are also here, you know, I might have to call them and say, hey, could you go get Mikey? You know, I really do have a great support system. Um, and aside from that, um, at work uh, professionally, I have, uh, like I stated earlier, created a network of people. Uh, my job is one that, you know, I've worked at times as a freelancer in this industry and your job and the longevity and the next job depends on who you know. It depends on the your last job or the relationship that you have. And so I, um, I have to say that it is, um, you know, myself, my network, con uh, maintaining these relationships, you know, calling someone, texting them, hey, how are you? Um, how's it going? How's the industry? So ma maintaining all of my relationships, um, whether it's personal or professional, is how I am able to maintain. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, having an amazing connection with my creator. Um, I could not have done it without that. I have to get in, even on a job. I, I'm one of those, I go in the bathroom. Lord God, please come down and help me right now. <laughs> <laughs> because there's times, um, you know, my friends and those that know me, I have no problems with speaking what is right here. Sometimes it doesn't even get here. It just <laughs> comes right out here. So, you know, I have to pray. You know, I have to pray. And um I just thank God for my, my church family, um, the Greater Allen Cathedral and the, the Dr. Floyd and Elaine Flake for teaching me um, how to have a relationship with God and how to actively use it on a daily basis, as well as Patricia <laughs> McCray, my mother, who has taught me that as well. So I must say um, that is my village and uh, my networking skills, definitely. You know what they say, Vanessa, women are the true superheroes. So kudos to you, superwoman. You. My <laughs> crown, my crown is Your up crown. there in the logo some kind of way. <laughs> Hey brothers, y'all the y'all the superheroes too. You got your crown too. Y'all see it? Uh, crown. That's right. We we support them. You know, we we are amazing support to our um you know our men, especially in the African American community. Um, I, I thank Fender for asking that because she is another superwoman to her superman. Um, mm -hmm. it is very important that we as women remember. Yes, we go out here and work and we do a lot of things for other people, but it is very important that we support our significant others, our husbands, our boyfriends, you know, those men, our fathers, those men that are supporting us. Um, we have to make that plate. It's not gonna hurt you, sis. Make that plate, you know. You really have to um, take care of those that support you. It is a give and take situation here. And um, just like um, alumnus Taggart was saying about his wife, um, I'm not sure what he was doing when he was on campus to get one, but he got to tell me, you got to text me, let me know how that works out for you. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's important for us to support our men. And, you know, M Marshall is not my husband, obviously, but I supported him when he was my president very wholeheartedly. And I do that just like now I'm supporting Devin White, Mark Fields, all of the um, men that are um, our leaders, we are here to be their support system, even, you know, and vice versa. So when we lead, they support us as well. So my little today. <laughs> Thank you for uh, telling us to make that plate, sis. <laughs> oh, I got some great quotes to leave with today. Okay, okay. <laughs> so let's go forward with our next question, which is from alumna Armina Hill. This question is for alumnus uh, Thompson. She says, the culture of NASCAR and racing is obvious with the waving of Confederate flags. It's impossible to avoid. Have you ever had a specific personal or professional situation where you couldn't be risk averse? How have you survived for so long in that culture? 
You got that rhinoceros skin, bro. You know? <laughs> <laughs> got that noob skin. Uh, That's how you survive, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the first thing to, to point out that it was it was covered pretty pretty heavily in the media, but the Confederate flag has now been banned from all NASCAR events. Uh, ac across the board, and so that's that's obviously a. Uh, I, I think it's fair. Super kudos to you guys. Thank for that. You. They mad. Certainly, they, they mad, mad, but they. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure, for sure. Um, but I think you, you know. I, I think um, that we can officially say now that that was a part of 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 what the of what the culture of the sport was, and certainly the the flag is a symbol of what's in people's hearts right and so you can't you can't as easily change that but um again as i pointed out earlier i think those those types of people those types of interactions are going to come up regardless of whether you're in nascar or walmart that's one of the things and rogers probably uh, uh heard me say this before is that you know we we continue to go to walmart we continue to go to football games baseball games whatever where these where these same kind of cultures and mindsets um are prevalent uh, you know, and it, and it is fair. I am not, uh, I don't have my head buried in the sand. And I think that there's certainly uh, at, at least the perception and, and certainly in the past, some some reality of the fact that people certainly felt a lot more comfortable with that in the NASCAR environment. And that's something that we'll continue to to strive to, to evolve and change o over time. But um, as for how I survived in the environment, I think is for having, it, it, it's the hope of, of days like, you know, or, or the month of June, right? When when things happen where, you know, we supported, uh, openly supported Pride Month, where we uh, banned the Confederate flag, where Bubba Wallace was able to run a Black Lives Matter paint scheme. Um, you can we'll also try to figure out a link to send to people if you want to buy that die cast as, as well. We can we can hook you up with a link to buy that at a, at a reduced rate. Um, <laughs> but so, you know, just being able to, uh, those moments uh, are, are what are what kept and the hope for those moments are what kept me kept me engaged. And I think the other thing, to be honest, is that there's a great culture around the sport of NASCAR outside of the negativity. I think um, the sport has gotten a bad rap candidly over the years. Some some deserved. I want to be clear about that. But I, I think over the over the majority of the folks uh, aren't like that. And I think uh, despite the negative commentary and things that you've seen on social media and that. Um, that's the that's the vocal minority, but the majority of NASCAR fans and, and employees and drivers, obviously, as we saw in support of Bubba at Talladega, um, are on the side of right and, and certainly are supportive of the moves that we've made over the over the past few years. And so that also goes into how we've been able to survive is that it's not this um, racial war zone, I think, that a lot of people uh, perceive it to be. Um, but uh, we'll get there. We have to, you know, that's obviously part of, of what I'm tasked with here is uh, to make uh, not only the people that I'm sharing this panel with, but all the people who are the 65 other participants who are here, to make them believe that through our actions, right, and through things that we're doing in and around the community and things like supporting um, Roger Carruth and his growth and development uh, and certainly have high hopes uh, for him. And he's progressing well and, and, and doing and, and showing his talents on the racetrack. And so we'll get there. It's not going to happen overnight, but uh, it's certainly part of what we're going to be tasked with moving forward. So Most definitely. I agree. We're going to take uh, two more questions and then we're going to go ahead and close out because I know we don't want to keep you guys long, okay? Um, our second question, well, our third question, excuse me, is for alumnus Karuth, and this is also from alumna Hillman. She said, what are your thoughts on the entertainment industry and the racial challenges? Um, that's a broad question. <laughs> but uh, tackle yeah. what you can to extent because you know it's out yeah. there yeah i'll try to answer that in two folds i want to tack on something i told you eight minutes wasn't enough but uh <laughs> <laughs> but uh i think it's a, it, it's a great time i was talking to someone yesterday and they pointed out three an older uh an older figure who you know we seek advice from and they pointed out three different points in time in the united states and history when it was good to be black and this is one of those moments, I think, because there's a social uh, consciousness that's awake. So uh, when you see Netflix saying that they're going to put $100 million in black banks, you know, the entertainment industry has been charged to say, you know, if you really step back and look at it, things are really, you know, it's, they're not cool. You know, there are things that should be naturally be uh, taken care of um, from people in front of the screen, behind the screen in so many different aspects. We don't need one or two shows, we need balanced shows. 
And that comes down to, I think, what Marshall talked about with his board. You need the talent. And if that talent happens to be black, then we're going to hire the black talent. So the entertainment industry, I think, is taking stock of that. And another part of that, too, is that they realize that we're at a tipping point. And if things don't change, things will be changed for them. And it prepares all of us here um, to take advantage of those opportunities. And I think that core value that we learn at CAU, those things kind of research. You know, now I always talk about steel. You only have to forge steel once, right? So you go through that process. And I think going through CAU learns us, it teaches us, I should say, the grit, I find a way of make one. And all these things we had to figure out when we first got to CAU, like Marshall talked about when Clark Atlanta, I mean, Atlanta University and Clark College merged and it, things are, you know, trying to be figured out. And we had to walk from McFeeders Dennis to the gym to, to from registration to financial aid, all these things that you, you develop, you don't know that you're, these are skills you're going to rely on as you matriculate throughout life. So as the entertainment industry is going through a shift, much like the country, um, they're figuring out that they need to actually put talented people in the places for them to succeed. And again, not just, you know, token shows or token opportunities, but opportunities that should have been there from the very beginning, particularly when your core audience and your core talent is the one that kind of makes the industry money. And the other thing that I want to tack on real quick is just the opportunity about networking. Um, as this thing happened with my son and, you know, these things are evolving, I, I called Marshall right away and I said, hey, Marshall, I talked to the folks at NASCAR. They're looking at spaces to screen this documentary. There's a track not too far. He's like, don't worry about it. We just set up direct routes from D.C. to, to Montgomery. We have a space here as a rotunda. We were looking at the Civil Rights Weekend to come down and screen the documentary. And when I talked to him, it wasn't like, no, I can't do it. We, it was just a matter of coordination at that point. And that just goes to that strong network. When we met Brandon, Brandon, first thing he said, man, you know, there's sometimes a disconnect between corporate and the people in the field. And that's kind of the same way with NASCAR. And he said, if anything happens, just, just call. And that's the kind of thing where relationships and networks develop. So I think an opportunity like this and forums like this give us a chance to kind of talk and let folks know what we're doing and uh, have a, a real one-on-one -on -one connection. And, you know, and I'm grateful to be a part of the panel. So hopefully I, I was able to answer that question. Nice. Nothing like true connections, networking, and brotherhood. I love it. I love it. Our last question for today is for alumnus. Oh, whatever. Did you answer it, Marshall? Oh, yeah, I did, but you can, you can go ahead and move forward. Was that Fender's question the last one? Yes. Okay, no problem. I'm going to answer it because you already you are answered it behind the scenes, but answer it in person. Oh, okay, hold on one second. <laughs> she just said, um, what challenges did you first encounter integrating the Montgomery community and how did you overcome? Well, I mean, I'm going to answer. I remember what I wrote. I mean, essentially, when you in turn come into an organization, you got to understand the aspect of change. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll bring up another author, favorite author of mine, Jim Collins. He talks about going from good to great, right? And so you want to basically look at the change management component and really look at how can you begin to change the mindsets of individuals so they can in turn move in the direction of how you want to move the organization forward. So one thing that Montgomery Regional Airport didn't have, they didn't have a mission, a vision, statement, strategic goals, or core values. In other words, how we treat one another, respect, honesty, fairness, being ethical. So all these things in terms of putting together from an organizational structure, you have to make sure that you lay the foundation associated with how you want to be and what will be the rules of engagement. And that not only includes your direct reports, members of the senior staff, but also members of the board. There are a total of nine. And so remember, I am, I am something that's different because I'm an African-American and, and my experiences are different. And I bring things to the table also with the fact that I know airports. And so some of the things that have transpired in the past uh, with having an airport director who was the fire chief, uh, that kind of the understanding about how airports work, that was very hard to deal with. So dealing with a cultural shift and doing lunch and learns every week with the staff, introducing other types of books like Who Moved My Cheese, 
Uh, also looking at books, The One Minute Manager, these are very crucial components, kind of nuggets for you as you in turn go in your career where there's a hostile environment. And I'm pretty sure Brandon has to deal with this on a regular basis. Roger, I know we talked about it uh, in terms of different things that your son is experiencing and what you even dealt with at, at Howard University, because there's an international component there that you have to go past in the African-American community. And I know Gaylin has done it. She's a, a, a master <laughs> at making sure, understanding, managing individuals and understanding the culture of the organization and using that in order to succeed. That's the key. I don't take anything personal. I mean, I've, I've gotten feedback where it's been done confidentially, where people put their hoods on and said, hey, Marshall, you are basically giving too many con minority contractors contracts. Okay, I could have been emotional about it, reacted to it, but I think the thing is what people don't understand, there is something called disadvantaged business enterprise and airport concessions, disadvantaged business enterprise. It's the law. You have to in turn incorporate things associated because we receive grant assurances as it relates to runways and taxiways. Mm -hmm. The board had no clue about that. So when I brought the actual written documentation to say, hey, this is what we have to do and we have to make a percentage goal associated with such, as such, it kind of, lightened the, the load and it dovetailed into one of our goals of preserving the financial health of the airport and so it's very key to include diversity it's very key to include different types of ways to do business at our airport so that's key so knowing the law understanding your role understanding that you're there as a change agent and that you're there to move the needle for the community should be your goal when you in turn step into your respective roles. That's very key and critical. Again, culture for service. And I always believe in finding a way of making one. And I did and got past it, okay? So let's roll. Okay. There we go, there we go. Paying it forward, I feel you. All right, so what we're gonna do is um, we got one little quick fun question for Roger, really quickly. Who is the greatest NFL football team in the nation? And you cannot say New York, uh, giants and your own view <laughs> that's, that's a tough question i usually wait till about uh week seven to pick my team um this is from alumnus uh will copper <laughs> oh <laughs> <laughs> oh man he said nfl right yeah oh that's a tough one oh man well what, what does the saying go either black quarterback first and black coach um, so I, I'll, I'll go with Seattle. I like Seattle. How about Seattle? That? Okay. Well, his second question, I'll grab it for you uh, in the chat so we can answer it on our post um, survey. Oh, okay. And, um, for um, alumnus Thompson, this one comes from um, Brother Rory. He said, Brother Thompson, how are you looking to diversify NASCAR? Will you all do a college visit via Zoom? So we're open. Uh, I think there's a lot of different ways and things that we're looking at. So uh, we've actually uh, done several college tour visits to CAU uh, over the over the years. And again, as uh, Marshall mentioned, like a huge HBCU supporter. Um, you know, been I feel like I've been going to an HBCU since I was watching a different world. Uh, so. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm certainly, uh, certainly, certainly open to that. And there's going to be some things that we're that we're looking at. Uh, we support CAU now um, in terms of some of the video boards and things that we've done on, on on campus, basketball and football games and all that. So we're definitely involved and looking to do even more as we move forward. Certainly. So whether it's college visits via via Zoom or you know live, you know, I, I don't want to throw live away. I'm not giving up on outside being open yet. So um, we'll certainly find our way. Uh, to 223 James B. Brawley Drive, Southwest, Atlanta, Georgia, 30314. <laughs> <laughs> hey. you, you better read that whole entire <laughs> <laughs> so what, um, what type of advice, I guess, would you offer to younger alumni who are new to the workplace for being sane and successful in those types of environments? You can either answer it now quickly or, you know, we can answer it in the post survey, whichever one you agree, whichever one you want to do. And this one is from Alumna Hill for 
Um, I think, look, I think it's, you, you've got to approach it with an attitude of excellence like you would anything else, right? It has to be deliberate in what you're trying to accomplish. And I think, but I think the other part of that is it's got to be natural. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not a believer in forcing yourself into situations. Um, to be uncomfortable is one thing, right? And push yourself beyond your, your comfort zone is one thing. But um, I think it's about aligning um, you, your goals with who it is that you're networking with. So obviously spending time, uh, for instance, uh, interacting with, um, with Vanessa, who, who's on the media and sort of finance and production side, if you're looking to get into, uh, I, I don't know, aviation, since we have Marshall here, right? Like it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense and vice versa. Uh, so I think it's about aligning, aligning strategically um, and certainly identifying ways that there are crossover, but I think it's also about being natural, being, you know, being yourself, being authentic. I think one of the things that um, frankly irritates me a bit in, in networking situations are when it's obvious that people are being fake. Um, and, and so I think that comes across, it's, it's very easy uh, for people to recognize, right? And so I think, uh, that, you know, you can't, you can't completely put down your veil. There's got to be a sense of professionalism around that. But by that same token, uh, being true to who you are and not, not, um, and not being inauthentic, I think is also very important. So being deliberate and strategic and being, being yourself and understanding that networking is hard for some people. Um, you know, you do have to push yourself somewhat beyond that comfort zone, uh, but not, not so far outside of your comfort zone that it feels uh, completely unnatural. Chastity, unmute. Unmute. So sorry, everyone. I was saying thank you so much for that. Um, definitely some nice gems that we could um, offer, not only to our young alumni, but to people that are in transition and, you know, to our um, prospective students that are aiming to get that internship or that fellowship or scholarship, whatever the case may be. So thank you for that. Um, please stay in contact with our alumni and look out for our upcoming webinars, which will take place every other Thursday from noon until 1 p.m. Immediately following this webinar, uh, well, as you all see on the screen, those are um, our upcoming webinars. If you are interested in attending those, uh, we will have the registration and the flyers that will be uh, promoted on all of our social panels. Uh, which is at CAU Alumni Relations on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And they will also um, reach your inboxes via cau.edu from our um, email. So please be on the lookout for those. Immediately following this webinar, you will receive a post survey. Please let us know what you think about today. Your feedback is very vital and is truly appreciated. So. Well, great. Thank you everyone for attending. We appreciate you all being here today. Super special thanks to my colleagues, Senior Director of Alumni Relations, Mrs. Gaylani Gatewood Joshua, who has a birthday tomorrow. Happy birthday, Gaylin. Woo woo. She gonna turn 33, y'all. Look at her. Look at fine. <laughs> like what? <laughs> woo woo. <laughs> And we got another panelist whose birthday is on Sunday. Happy early birthday, Vanessa. Happy birthday. Turning 22 <laughs> on a Sunday. We see you. Right. You better make that play. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, definitely. Please let us know what you think about today. Your uh, feedback is definitely appreciated. Also, super special thanks to Dr. Rose for your seller service and to our panels for your remarkable job today. This panel was on fire, y'all. So we appreciate you all for coming out and for joining us. And we will see you in our next uh, panel, which is July 16th at noon. Look out for the announcements. Peace, love, and soul. And don't forget to